So I still work, I've got lots of things to say, um, but I'm really happy to be interrupted. Um, I won't wait for you, so just throw something at me, raise a hand, do whatever you need to do to stop me. Um, but I, I really will, I'm really happy to interact and, um, and to tell you what's going on. Let me tell you a little bit about me, because if I don't do that, um, you won't understand my context. So a little bit about us. So I want to start off by saying uh, that uh, every place is unique. What that means is I am in a very specific spot, and uh, you're in a different spot to me. Uh, every plant is unique, so there's all factors that come into how you got to be where you are. Denominational things, personal things. Now, I think this is explicitly against what we said last night. Everyone says they're unique, they're all the same or something, I think. But anyway, uh, every leader is unique. And, and here's something I want to encourage you, just as a way to consume Multiply, if I can say this to you. Um, one of the ways that I've found, so this is my fifth Multiply. Um, one of the things I've found is everyone will lead and teach from their area of strength. It just makes sense, right? So why am I doing a seminar on this? Because I'm not rubbish at it, okay? What I'm not doing a seminar on is the stuff I'm rubbish at, okay? But what you don't know about me when I do this seminar is that there's stuff that I'm rubbish at, right? So I just went downstairs and sat at the organisational leadership one, okay? And I'm like, man, we've got to grow there. There's all sorts of systems and structures we don't have in place. So as you see this, what you're not allowed to do is extrapolate my strength into a, an unimpeachable wall of excellence in everything, okay? I, I'm just like you, I'm good at some stuff. I don't know the stuff that you're good at, but you are good at stuff, all right? And so as we do this today, I just wanna encourage you, um, I'm gonna tell you some stuff that I, I'm not crap at, all right? But there is lots of areas that we're not great at as a church. Does that have to come to you? A little bit of, uh, a little bit of background. Um, so who are we as a church? So I'm at New Life Anglican in Oran Park. Um, so this is me and my wife Carolyn. Um, Carolyn likes to tell people she's my better 60%, which is great. Um, Jeff and Kathy uh, work with us. He's a retired Anglican minister. He's on two days a week with us. And then I have Michael, who's a full-time kids, family and youth pastor, or kids, youth and family pastor, that's the KYF. Too long to write out. Um, so that's our little team. We've been going for five and a half years. and. Uh, if I can show you a little bit about where we are, we're in Oran Park, which is southwest of Sydney, um, where basically we're turning uh, fields and pastures uh, into suburbs. So the plan when I got started was that they were going to put 700 homes a year into Oran Park, this place where I am, and um, the year before last they, they had 1,250 lots sold in the year. So it's just an extraordinary area of growth. And between we, where we are and about 20 minutes up the road, over the next 30 years, there's going to be 300,000 people coming into our area, which is the whole of Canberra, or all of Newcastle, um, or all of the Illawarra, you know, other parts of Sydney around here. So an extraordinary number of people are moving in. Now, that's really important to note, right? Whatever I tell you about how our church is going or growing or whatever, whatever our success and phones are, if you're in a stable suburb, if you're in an inner city, like, there's just other factors at work. So you need to know that about our story. Does that make sense? We think that's pretty incredible, this growth dynamic, because that becomes this in sort of over the period of like about 12 months. And the really exciting thing about that, we say, is lives in transition are open, okay? And so as you relocate, where do I do my hair? Where do I buy my groceries? Who's over the fence? All of these stable questions are now up for grabs and you're asking them again. And in that environment, we think there's an openness to consider Jesus in a way that if I've been in the same suburb, same house for the last 30 years, you're not as open personally to that change. So we think there's a pretty unique opportunity there. Um, we called the church New Life off the back of the fact that people are coming to find a new life in a new suburb, building a new home, but specifically for this passage in 2 Corinthians 5, where it says, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So we want people to, they're starting a new life, that's what they're doing with new homes, but we want them to find new life in Jesus. So, the church is called New Life. Works on two levels. So what's our vision? Uh, we long to see new life in Jesus come to every home in Oran Park and the growing southwest for their salvation, for the good of the community and the glory of God. And I'm passionate about that. that that's what we're on about. So new life in every home. Um, so for us, we've kind of, as a staff team, as a church, we're committed to being perpetually dissatisfied. Does that make sense? Um, so if we get a big church under God's good grace, if he builds that, 
rather than patting ourselves on the back and looking in at what we're a big group of people, we want to continually be looking out and saying we're not there yet. Uh, because what we believe theologically about the people who are not there yet is pretty dire, isn't it? And so a while ago in Sydney we have had our, our Archbishop, I think helpfully, challenge us to think about 10% of people in Bible-believing churches. Maybe you've heard that. That's an Anglican thing. Um, and that was great for organising us, but the reality is I don't want 10% of people in Bible-believing churches, do I? We're 100% of people in Bible. Now, it's not only my responsibility, but I want my church to be looking out to Oran Park and then to the Grand Southwest and go, hey guys, we're going to be thinking every single home. How are we doing? Okay. For their salvation, duh. For the good of the community, probably a little bit more controversial, we believe as more homes come to know Jesus, there's actually going to be a difference in our community. It's actually going to transform our community. And we want that to bring glory to God. So that's what we're on now as a church. Uh, when we say how are we going to do that, what's our mission? So vision is the preferred picture of the future. Mission is how we're planning to do it. So I'm going to teach you guys our, our, our stuff here. So what's the name of our church? New Life. What do we want to see? New Life in every home. Don't worry about the rest of it. So our church is called New Life. Great. What do we want to see? New Life in every home. Fantastic. How are we going to do it? We're going to give the message of New Life and we're going to live New Life for Jesus. We're going to give it and we're going to live it. How are we doing so far? And the church is? Life. What do we want to see? New life in every home. How are we going to do it? Give it and live it. Okay, done. You guys have nailed it. That's fantastic. So we're going to give it and we're going to live it, okay? That's what we're that's what we're about. We're going to do that by connecting, caring, communicating, and leaving people to commit. A whole different seminar. Maybe we'll do that another time. Um, and we want to live new life for Jesus by being faithful, adventurous, compassionate, and enduring. That's our picture of discipleship. Okay. How do we do that? And um, we've got a plan for doing that that involves this tree. We connect, we care, we communicate, we leave people to commit, and we want to grow disciples or apprentices to Jesus who are faithful, adventurous, compassionate, and enduring. And under each of these, we've got a set of questions that take this value into a conversation. So I might ask you, under this one, to see if I encourage you to be faithful, what are you learning as you read the Bible and pray today? Well, now we're having a conversation about what it looks like to be faithful. Under adventurous, uh, under here, we ask, what are you praying that only God can do? It's a really exciting question, right? Oh, I've never thought of doing that. Well, let's start there. We're having a conversation. So, our values into conversations. All right. New Life Anglican Church started with Mandy Payne and, and my wife Carolyn and I in the living room, four adults and four kids. Uh, an auspicious and giant launch team, yeah? Um, as I, as I watch uh, what's developing in our network, I'm absolutely blown away at the teams that people pull together when they start churches. Um, actually, Luther's a perfect example. Luther, how big was your launch team, mate? Uh, 40. Okay, love this, right? Amazing, fantastic. Um, I, I know a guy who is down in Melbourne who I'm coaching, and his launch team is about 70. I'm just like, that is a church. That's not a launch team. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, the, the interesting thing for us, our, say, our story was four adults, four kids in a living room. Um, we took a year to launch, so we, we were sitting in our living room training and equipping our team, casting vision. Um, really interestingly, talking about the, the growth dynamics that Toby was talking about the other night, um, telling our guys, this isn't church. This is building a launch team for church beginning. Okay? So if you love the living room, we want to encourage you, the living room is great, but it's preparing us to do something in the future. And we were telling people when we were this side, this was our launch day uh, in 2013. Uh, we had a whole bunch of friends and family come to make us feel bigger. Brilliant. Um, so 75 kids and adults on that day, amazing. And then the next week, I think it was like 25 adults and about 14 kids. Just to give you the reality of what that looked like, okay? Um, but what we're telling the church at this time is, this is not the church where we will be. This is the church we are today. We are planning to be other than this. So don't fall in love with this. Don't fall in love with this. And we've just repeatedly said to our people, we're trying to be something else because of what? What's our vision? Seeing new life in? Okay, can a, can a church only <laughs> see new life in every home stay this size? No, nope. not least of all because there's going to be 700 homes a year more in our suburb next year. Making sense, right? So we've got to, we've got to keep sowing all of that. Um, we, this was us uh, four years later, and then uh, 
two weeks, three weeks ago, we launched an evening service, which is very exciting. Um, so, uh, we grew, I don't know if you've seen these stats from Scott, so that's Canada church growth, first year, second year, third year, fourth year. This green line is Australia church growth, um, that's our church growth, new life, and then here's the Americans to keep us all humble. <laughs> um, this is us over a number of years, so first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, um, over the, the weeks of the year. Do you have some days like this? Anyway, that's just the reality, right? So I want, I want you to see this is kind of how we grew. So each year you can see the, the coloured lines are further above than the year before. That's really great. Thank you, Jesus. And, um, and we're having a good year so far this year, which is great. How do we fit into Sydney? So an Anglican church. So um, the diocese helped us. We had a local bishop who helped us. And we had a team who looked after us. If you're outside the Anglican system, that doesn't really matter. Uh, but here's what matters. Here's what matters. How do we fund it? Uh, the region, our Anglican region, funded me at 100% in the first year. Yeah. <laughs> How good is that, right? That's amazing. What they set up for me was every year that would drop 25%. Okay? Now, talk about humble and hungry. You get pretty hungry when you know that it's falling away <laughs> like that. Some of you will even be hungrier than that because you're working bivocationally and you're thinking, how do I work to the point where I'm actually going to be able to pay for this myself? How do we, you know, there's some real pressures on you. I'm just telling you, this is my story. It's important to understand it before I tell you the pragmatics, yeah? Um, now, remember, I had a second guy on from the start and we did some fundraising for him. So, um, so I went and sought a grant to help me support him. I did fundraising. And uh, what we did was we had uh, separate fundraising. I got him to get together all the people he could find who were doing ministry. And we had an extraordinary fundraising night uh, where God was very obviously in the house. Um, we raised 35 grand um, in a night from people being committed. I can tell you some more about that, but that was pretty huge. And then off the back of this one that I held with my friends, we raised, I think, another 15. Uh, so what that meant for us was we could do something pretty extraordinary early on by bringing him. He was very faithful in saying that he would work part-time at the start until we got this, the grant and also our fundraising come through. So I'm ex extraordinarily grateful to their sacrifice and their faith in stepping into that. But So we did that through a grant, through fundraising. Uh, this is another one of those fundraising nights. Um, through prayer, so we had over 100 people that were committed to pray regularly for our, our church plan. I encourage you, that's awesome. And um, Scott's got some amazing stats from Ed Stetzer on church growth when you've got external people praying for you. And you watch those graphs, get excited about asking people beyond your church to pray for your church, okay? It, it is demonstrably, statistically better when you do that. So, prayer. Um, and, then, uh, and then personally, uh, we were giving money into the church plan as well, which was, which was good. So let me think about money and you. How do you feel about money? Necessary. Okay, necessary. That's helpful. Thank you. Someone else, how do you feel about money? Hard to get, easy to lose. Hard to get, easy to lose. Fantastic. Yeah, very good. Someone else? It's a blessing from God. It's a blessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really good. Someone else? It's a nice little window into where we stand with the gospel, mm. the way we use it. Sure, but not talked about. It's a sort of hidden godliness or godlessness. Yeah, that's really interesting because because as Australians, it's totally off the table, isn't it? Like, just we just can't talk about money. Can we? You know, it's not like you rock up, you went, how much you make? It's just totally you can't talk about money. So I want to say to you, first of all, money is a spiritual issue. Money is a spiritual issue. It's really helpful, Luther. So you're just saying it's a little window into our into our soul. Money is a spiritual issue. So when so when God uh, when God talks to us about money, uh, his son Jesus, first of all, said it was impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Did you know that? That's pretty spiritual, isn't it? Richness makes it impossible to enter the kingdom of heaven, except for God. That's a striking passage, right? And then, and then he says you can't serve both God and money. It's impossible to do that. Those two things can't be served together. Um, I, I want to say to you 
that the reason you should be committed to thinking about money, and we're here to raise money to make churches happen, and at that level we can just cut straight through. Give me the pragmatic answer so I get paid tomorrow, right? That's what we can be thinking about. I want to tell you, you need to be concerned about money because it's killing your people if it's not serving God. Because if you're pastoring your people and you think money is an irrelevance, you are not doing your job as a pastor. Have I said that strongly enough for you? If you can't serve God and money, right, and we're not interested in talking about money, and our society is somewhat interested in kind of putting money forward as being important, would you agree? How can we be totally uninterested in talking about money? Woe to us, I think. So I want to tell you, money's a spiritual issue. We need to think about it pastorally. And, and I, you know, someone challenged me, you know, would you have a conversation with someone about their marriage? Guys, would, would you? Why would you do that? Why would you be interested in their marriage? It really matters, doesn't it? This is a sphere of godliness. It's also a way of servant leadership. There's all this stuff going on, right? But we would never have a pastoral conversation with someone about money, would we? Like, isn't that, even just as a category, a pastoral conversation about money just sounds like, what? But I'm saying to you, it's a spiritual issue, so where are we on this? We need to think about it missionally. So what can money do? can money do? Well, it empowers our church plans. And, and I remember running a seminar some while, uh, maybe three or four years ago, and just saying to a whole bunch of hungry, keen church planners, saying, who here loves to talk about money? And I ask you the same question. Who loves to talk about money here? Put your hands straight up. Okay. Wow, fantastic. Good work. Good work. Great work. Um, I think if you, if you can't be excited about money, you really aren't in, interested in seeing the mission advance particularly if you're the leader of your church plan, right? Who is responsible for the money? If it's not you, who is? My treasurer for counting it. He's going to have a pretty live on job if you're not interested in doing it. Can I encourage you? Okay. And the reason I'm interested in it, because I'm interested in it spiritually, I'm interested in it pastorally, and I'm absolutely interested in it missionally, right? I want my church to be around tomorrow. I want to get paid, and I want to get as many people as I can to help me make that happen. No? Yes? Some feedback. It's after lunch. Yeah? You're interested? <laughs> All right. Um, I want to talk about it then unapologetically. Right? Because the mission matters. Because I'm committed to you personally and pastorally. Because your spiritual life is at stake if I don't. So when I talk about it, I don't want to go, oh, I'm sorry, guys, can I have to talk about money today? And um, it's mostly because I've got to pay the bills. And I don't want to talk to my wife about the fact that I don't have any money. So I should talk to you. Rubbish, right? Of course I want to talk to you about money. What a brilliant opportunity to talk about one aspect of your maturity and your spirituality. Let's get into it. Not least of all, because I want to help you join me in making God's mission happen in the world. Um, no one else is losing sleep about the lack of money in your church. <laughs> no, they aren't. They're excited about it, they're worried about how the minute, they're doing all sorts of other things, but no one else is going to lose sleep about the money other than you. So I want to tell you, you have to care about it, and then you have to talk about it yourself, not somebody else. So don't get the treasurer up. See, the treasurer is interested in counting it, okay? <laughs> Seriously, he is, that's great. Your wardens may be interested in making sure that, or whatever your structure is, your elders might be interested in making sure that it happened, and that the treasurer has counted it correctly. But you should be interested in it because of what it does, about where it takes you, not, not just as a source to alleviate my worry or concern. Okay. So you need to talk about it because you don't outboard that to anyone else uh, on any other issue in terms of setting the vision and direction. It's your job. All right. How do you feel about money? I, I want to ask you this question. I was really surprised when um, I was chatting with someone and they said to me, what do you mean? I want to ask you, are you giving to your church? I tell you with no grandioseness that we tied to our church from the first moment we got started. Not least of all because I was the only person who had money in that church, and that's not cool. But but here's the thing: um, I'm committed to seeing my church go forward. Seriously, it, it's the classic case of I, I remember someone saying they were they were really over their church and they knew they were in trouble when they thought if I wasn't the pastor of this church, I wouldn't be coming here on Sunday. <laughs> I, I think the same thing applies, which is. If I wasn't the pastor of the church, I wouldn't be giving here. I think that's rubbish. So you're saying you just put your money where you're 
That is exactly what I'm saying to you. That's exactly what I'm saying to you. And, and I don't get, I don't get the hypocrisy that suggests you want to ask others to do it if you can't be bothered doing it yourself. We clear enough on that? I, I, I just think that's a, that's a no-brainer. So get into it. And not least of all, you'll be pretty interested in where it's been taking care of it. When part of it's yours. <laughs> okay, very good. So I want to ask you, are you giving to your church? Okay, money in your team. So I was initially asked to speak on money in your team. This is, uh, this is my team at the moment, my, my, uh, my leaders. This is my parish council. Uh, we all have different church policy. Uh, so you might have elders, you might have uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of different arrangements. This is my core leadership team. Um, they're a great group. I love them to bits. And I could talk about money and that team. And one of the things I say with that team is, um, I'm going to expect you to be a partner with us. I'm going to explain what that is in a second. And I'm going to expect you to be giving. In fact, this team here, at our close team, you're going to be leading our people in giving. <coughs> So when we do our, um, our vision stuff, I will come to the church and say carefully what my wife and I are prepared to give and what collectively our parish council are going to give and then I'll call our congregation to give. So I'm saying to those guys, guys, if you're joining this team, I'm looking for you to be part of leading us in a whole bunch of ways, with character, with convictions, and yes, financially as well. Making sense? All right. There's a bigger team, though. Um, this is this group here, uh, who are um, the wonderful saints at, uh, at New Life. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we, how we get those t that team on board. Um, I learned all the stuff that I know about uh, money from a guy called Rod Irvine. His book downstairs is called uh, Giving Generously. Uh, it is a brilliant book. Um, in it, he sets forth all the stuff that I learned from him, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, and he does it from the perspective of how to raise funds for everyday stuff and then how to raise funds for big capital campaigns. Um, he is absolutely legendary at it. Um, what he did, no one in Australia knew anything about it. So he spent the time to interact with all the guys from overseas. He then synthesised all that, pulled it together and then took it for a trial run in Australia when no one else was doing this stuff. Um, he's very, very good at it. Um, one of the things he kept on saying uh, from the stuff that he got from overseas was we have to figure fight, we're at Fig Tree Anglican Church, we have to figure fight. And what he meant was you can find the idea in America, but you have to think it into Australian culture and context. Okay? And what I'm going to show you is what works at New Life Anglican Church in Oran Park. Okay? And I want you to something apply it in your world. Does this make sense? You're going to have to think what will fly there. I'll show you some principles. I'll show you some structures, but I want you to think it into your place, your language. Does that make sense? And if, it does, if it's not you, and it's not your people, it won't pass the sniff test, will it? That wasn't made here. That's somebody else's weirdness that you're bringing on to us, yeah? Now, you don't do that. You don't, you don't do that with your preaching, right? None of us do that without preaching. Oh, I just found this on the internet, so I'm going to preach it word for word from some other joker. Well, if you do, please leave the room now and I'll continue with everyone else. No, we don't do that and we would feel icky doing that, right? So I'm just saying, when we, when we get to this stuff, I'm going to show you what works for us and why, but I want, to, I want you to do the hard work, right? How do we think that into where we are? You with me? All right, good. No one's asked me a question yet, which is okay by me, um, but I just want to remind you, you can. All right, this is Rod's equation. I think this is the beating heart of the whole thing, okay? And it's, he didn't call it Rod's equation, by the way. This is me synthesising what he does. Um, Rod's equation is vision plus trust equals generous giving. Take this to the bank, uh, so to speak. Uh, vision plus trust equals generous giving. I'll explain what that means, and I'll tell you why it's so important. So vision. I don't know, I, we haven't had this discussion, I've just assumed that you get what vision is about. Um, it appears to me, there are a bunch of people who think that this is corporate mumbo jumbo and they don't like this marketing rubbish, kind of invading the beauty of the gospel. I, honestly, I've got no time for that. If, 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 that, if that's your problem, I'm not going to try and convince you today. Other than this, I think you do have a preferred picture of the future. And if you don't call it vision, I could not care less. Okay. What I'm telling you is, do you as a leader have an idea of how this suburb is going to be transformed by the ministry of the good news of Jesus? 
And if you've got no idea about what you're looking for, well, that's a leadership problem and you might need to pray and think about that, right? But I'm saying a vision is a clear and compelling picture of your preferred future, okay? This is what I hope will happen under God as we minister the good news of Jesus. It's no, no guarantee that it will happen. It's no compulsion that it must happen. It's simply, this is where I'm intending to take you. Remember what Andrew was saying about leadership? Taking people somewhere they wouldn't otherwise like to go. Yeah, do you remember that from last night? So here's where I want us to go. That's what the vision is. So first of all, you have to have a clear and compelling picture of your preferred future. And my picture is what? What's your church called? Life. And what am I looking to see? New life in every home. You guys are killing it. Fantastic. Okay, so new life in every home is my compelling picture of the future. That's what I'm on about. Vision plus trust. Trust is vision becoming reality one concrete step at a time over time. Vision becoming reality one concrete step at a time over time. Now, you can define trust whatever way you want. The, the point here is, um, I can tell you about the future, but if you don't trust that we can get there, there is no way you're unlocking generous gift. Similarly, you might be a really trustworthy person and have no picture of the future, and people will give you some money but if you want to see this thing, this thing called generous giving happen, you've got to put the two of them together, okay? I need to have a compelling picture of the future, and you have to believe that I can take you there in some way. I'm getting there a step at a time. Making sense? Yes, sort of. All right. Generous giving is this. Sacrificial giving that is costly but joyful. Much more than money, but not less than money. Okay? Much more than money, but not less than money. What do you mean by that? So, what I mean is, I want people, we talk about three things, time, talents, and treasure, okay? So I want your time, I want to be able to see that you can give your time to serving in our ministries. Um, I want to think about your talents. There are skills and gifts that you have that I'd love to see you set loose um, for kingdom purposes. Treasure. There's money that you have that I'd like to direct to gospel purposes. So, generous giving, I actually want to capture the whole of someone's life and point it in a kingdom direction, right? Okay. And so I think that only happens, you only see generous giving if you've got this vision plus trust combination. Yes, question. Are you suggesting that as a baseline, you would prefer people just gave money um, if they could use your, their time and talents? Um, I have the cash. No, I'd say um, I'd say let's figure out what ways you can bring all of who you are to God's service. Um, if you've got limited time, let's talk about the time you have. Um, if you've got limited talents, let's work with what you have. Um, and, and likewise, if I only get two out of those three, no problems. What, what, what I guess I'm saying is, I want to try and draw out who you are, who God's made you, what the resources you have in His to put at his disposal. That's what I'm saying. Anyone think of any reasons why I might not be completely crazy in doing that? Yes? Uh, cashless economy and it's weird for ourselves. Great. Cashless economy meaning? Keep going. I don't carry cash. Yeah, that's right. And neither, and neither does anybody else except your bank account, where everything is paid for by cash. <laughs> right. In, in paper bags. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, now that's really helpful. So cashless society, and what was your second one? Uh, it's weird for outsiders. They don't know what to do with it and they feel bad about passing it on. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It doesn't feel like that. It's good. We can add something. Like? Um, oh, yeah, I was just going to say it gives an opportunity for people that might, um, might want to give money not with completely pure motives to flush out a couple of 50s. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah. That's really helpful. Yeah. Well, I didn't have one, but I'll, I'll give you one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. Fantastic. Magic also, figure of compulsion. Also, <laughs> sure, um, not letting your left hand do your right hand. So I'm giving money, perhaps it's supposed to be actually kind of gracious and selfless as opposed to being flashy. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. Add another one. It's also easy to make bread drop. You just put a bread drawing finger in the finger pack. It's good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what can it do stand? It's not actually clear whether it's part of worship or not. It's an act of worship, but it's not necessarily part of the service. Yeah, good one. Okay, so we don't see any biblical compulsion mm. to do it. Yeah. Um, even those that are inside the church feel uncomfortable with it at times if you compare each other to what's being given. Super, yeah, yeah, really good, really good. 
Um, here's why. Uh, I want to say no guilt for the guest. So I, th I think, I, I think this is what people expect when they come to the church. Mm. I think they expect us to ask them for money. Yeah. I want them to be pleasantly surprised that I didn't ask them for money. And I want to offer them free of charge the incredible grace of Jesus mm. at extraordinary cost, don't I? At extraordinary cost. It will cost you your life. You'll lose your life in order to save it. So I don't want to confuse that kind of value discussion with, can I have a couple of your notes from your wallet? Um, secondly, uh, this, is, this is probably a bit naughty, but I don't want to alleviate the guilt of the regular. I'll tell you what I mean by that. So the bag comes around. Incidentally, guys, well done, you're surviving this, uh, this group. Um, we're losing people. Um, but I mean, you're surviving, so that's good. Um, what, what happens when the bag comes around, uh, plate, whatever device you have, um, here's what happens. Uh, it comes to me, I haven't really thought about it, even though it happens every week, somehow I haven't thought about it. What I do is I open my wallet, assuming I have any cash on me, I look in and I find the second biggest note in my wallet. <laughs> and I pull that out and I put that in. And because I've done that, I feel I'm contributing to the work of ministry at the church. That, that's garbage. <laughs> and if someone thinks that's a more spiritual way of giving up, I can't see anything great about that from my perspective. I want to say you don't get to feel good about giving me your second biggest note in your wallet. I want to remove the opportunity for you to feel like you've contributed. You don't get to contribute here. That's been strong enough. So here's, here's why. Your spare change won't fund our ministry. Your spare change won't fund our ministry. If you haven't come across this yet, I just, want to, I just want to say this to you really strongly, right? I don't want to collect up everybody's $20 notes this week. I, I literally, there's no way in the world I have a second staff member on if that's what we're doing. I prob I'm probably not paid for yet. I, I can't be clear enough about this. You, you won't hoover up enough cash each week from passing the bowl around if that's how you reckon you're going to pay for your money. Unless you go to church of a thousand, which I think we're talking about church planning, you probably don't. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Do the husband and wife give separately? How, like I just I don't know how the economics of this work, and I think it's just a terrible idea. So I want to tell them, no, 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 your spare change won't fund your ministry. I don't want to give you a chance to make you feel like you've contributed, and I don't want to make my guests feel guilty. Yeah, go, go I'm sure there'll be questions. Yeah, go. Do you, um, how do you make clear what you're saying if you say it's at the front is specifically for people who consider themselves part of church? And yeah. Like if you, if you say, your spare chain won't find our ministry, yeah. how do you kind of say... Oh no, I don't talk about it at all. I don't talk about it at all because I don't take up a collection. So I don't even have to have the one where we go, oh, if you're a guest, let it go past and don't feel guilty. And I, I don't have any of those conversations at all, not one. Because I don't ever take it up. <coughs> People don't see money. You'll hear about money in our church at our AGM and when the Bible talks it up as we preach exegetically. That's when you hear about money in our church. Aside from that, you will not hear anything about money in our church. You said, so that's you, you obviously say this at some point to a group. Yep, can I tell you about that? Okay, yeah. That's so I think that's what yeah. you want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want, to, I want to tell you how we do it. Because your next question is, sure. So you don't do that. That's wonderful. How the heck do you get money? Right? That's the next question, isn't it? <laughs> obviously. So yeah, so who, who do I talk to? Aha. Hello. Hello, a thing we call partnership. Now, I'm prepared to say we're unusual in this. I want to try and convince you why we do this. You don't have to do it, but I'll tell you why we do it. Does that make sense? Great. Well, let's talk about partnership. Partnership at New Life is the way you become involved in ministry. Partnership at New Life is the way you become involved in ministry. What that means is, if you're new with us, we say be our guest until you're ready to be our partner. Be our guest for as long as it takes until you're willing to be our partner. We run our partnership course every term, every term, and at that we say, hey, you've been coming for a while, why don't you come and join us as a partner? What that involves is uh, coming and doing a four week course with us. Now, just before we get to that, let me see if I can be really clear. It appears to, it appears to me, some people think that the way to get more people involved is to lower the bar is to lower the bar. How do we get more people involved? We'll make it easier for people to serve. We've done exactly the opposite. 
We have told people you can't serve, you cannot take out the rubbish, you can't wash up the dishes, you certainly cannot lead in our kids' ministry, you cannot do anything in our church until you're a part. Now, that's crazy, right? We are crazy. But I'll tell you what, tell you what happens at the partnership course. We spend four weeks. In the first week, we introduce New Life Anglican Church. So we say, what is our vision and values? What are our, what's our mission? What are we here to do? We want to tell you about that. I want to cast a compelling picture of the future. I'm sorry this is so small. Um, number two, um, we tell people what we expect of them as partners. So we've got eight <coughs> things that we talk about, and they are to do with character and convictions. Okay? To use the language that we were, we were picking up the other night. So we have eight things, and maybe afterwards if we get through all this stuff, I can show you what they are. Um, but we spend that two hours saying, here's what we will expect from you as partners, and what you can expect from me as a leader. Remember that above and alongside that Andrew was talking about last night? There's a sense in which I'm a partner at New Life Anglican Church, and so I'm going to stand alongside you, and we're going to learn how to relate this way, we're going to serve this way, we're going to speak to each other this way. That's going to be an incredibly important part of uh, what it means to be a partner. Okay, so vision and then expectations. Um, incidentally, my thing is with, with leadership is it's all about expectations. So if I can tell you in advance what to expect, when it gets hard, we are having a totally different conversation than if you didn't know what my expectations are and I have to call you back to some standard you didn't know. Are you with me? So if I tell you, actually the standard is like this, I'm inviting you to be a part of this. When that, if, if you fall short of that, if, if I fall short of it, it gets messed up. When I have that conversation, I can say, this standard existed separate from both of us having a problem. And I'm going to call us back to this thing rather than I'm having an awkward conversation where there's sort of a, a leadership uh, authority dynamic as well as some sort of sin thing. It gets very awkward in that space. So what I want to say up front is, here's our expectation for you as a partner. This is what, what, we're, what we're intending to do together. Um, the third week is how we do God's mission together. So what does mission look like at New Life Anglican Church? Why do we do it and how do we do it? We have in the Bible, we look at a bunch of stuff there. The fourth week is a safe ministry training course. Again, I'm going to go heavy on this for you, okay? You can't serve doing anything in our church without doing safe ministry training. Nothing. Now, I, I say to my church, Anything we do at New Life, there's always a scar or a story. Okay, so but there's something that I've been scarred by that's happened in my past in, in ministry. That's why we do it. Or there's a story. I've got an intentionality for why we do it. There's a scar or a story. There's a scar on this one. Um, my previous church saw a guy who was involved in um, uh, in a particular ministry that you would say had nothing to do with kids. Use the authority of that ministry to influence. Um, some kids were under his care and ended up abusing them. And you would think about it and you'd say, there's no way in the world, I won't even tell you what the name of the ministry is, okay? But there's no way this ministry has anything to do with kids, right? It just doesn't. So what's our typical response to that? Oh, they don't need to do safe ministry training. I, I've said to, I think in a, in a Royal Commission environment, I, I'm thinking, Look, the reality is, I don't want anyone with any responsibility to do anything in my church who doesn't know what the standards of safe ministry are, who doesn't have the eyes of safe ministry, and who doesn't know that I'm going to put them through it as the path to serving. So I can't keep all my kids safe. I've got to keep entrusting that to God's care, right? But the reality is, I want to make it as hard for anybody who wants to get into the life of my church, and I want them to know the barriers high, that we're going to do the working with children check, that they've got to go through this process. And if anyone complains, so funny. If anyone complains, goes, hey, look, I've done this training somewhere else. I don't need to do it. I say, look, we're really committed to the safety of our kids. I want to make sure that we're delivering that personally. If that's something that you find too hard, this might not be the church for you. I'm, I'm seriously prepared to let you go, rather than you compromise the integrity of our system for our kids. Not stuffing around. And I will stare anyone in the face and I will steer them out of the church if I need to because I will not compromise on this one. So, partnership, great, hey, who doesn't want to be part of that? So did your team come up with this or did you pull it out from somewhere? No, we came up with this. The idea is around, isn't it? Yeah. This sort of membership yeah. in various churches yeah. and that sort of stuff. I think <coughs> we just applied it in a pretty psycho way. <laughs> <laughs> 
so this this course, yeah, um, my associate uh, Matthew and I worked with um, worked very hard on this with me, and we yeah, this is the course that we kind of developed. Um, Thanks, Stuart. Good question. Like where Anglicans are right, but you know, there's going to be some different denominations flying. Around. Imagine, but keep going. Yeah, with different uh, <laughs> church polities, and so how does this work in? Because we don't even have a church membership as a yeah. church, right? Yeah. How do you work that in with that, and what do you say yeah. to others who have formal structure? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so my, my respect, this is where you need to figure what you need to do the hard work in your, in your thing. Here's what I'd say. I reckon this is incredibly hard to bolt on after. Yeah. Right? Oh, I'm already serving in the washing up roster. You can't ask me to do this course. You'll really offend me, right? Uh, how could we ask Doris not to do it if she won't do the course? And it gets really hard. So we went, we went, we took all of our core team through the course first, and there's been no one serving in our church since who hasn't done the partnership course. So how do you do it? I don't know what the structure looks like in your church. All I'd encourage you to do is find a way to make serving a privilege with a high bar of expectation and have that be clear for as many people as you can. Now, if you've got something existing or you find it hard to implement, I can understand that. All I'm presenting to you, remember I said, find new sort of circumstances. But, but so it's a good question like that. I, I don't know how it intersects with Baptists and Prezies and everyone else, or FYAC people, or whoever else is in the room. But I want you to think about it, because I think it's worth doing. Just, okay. Just on this. Yeah, go. So, I don't know if this is the same thing you're asking. So just tell me, dealt with it. So, but theologically, how do you, how do you Yeah, um, uh, all I'm saying is this is a pragmatic way for me to guard what I'm trying to do as a church. I don't even try and excuse it. I can't find you a Bible person partnership. What I can find is Paul in Philippians saying we thank God for your partnership in the gospel. And all we say is this is a man-made way for you to join in partnership in the gospel with us at New Life Anglican Church. I don't need to tell you that you're compelled to do it because you're free to go somewhere else if you don't want to do it. There's no biblical compulsion to doing it. All I'm saying to you is we have a structure for safeguarding kids particularly, for raising the bar and expectation of service, and for joining together with cohesion as a group of people who get the vision and mission of our church. Does that make sense? I think sometimes we can make stuff equally biblical. Like, it's just, it's just not. Like, I, there's no... There's no partnership course in the Bible. But I just want to say it's useful, it's organised, it helps us to partner together. Does that answer your question, mate? Yes, you well, I don't want to come back on it and say, well, it's not biblical. Well, I, I, feel like, I feel like you're kind of saying, look, pragmatically, it works. Yes. Um, theologically, I don't really know, but pragmatically, it works. Oh, I'm not saying I'm not interested in theology. All I'm saying to you is I won't try and justify the why of it theologically. So um, I want to make sure that, uh, that the people who are serving have character and convictions like everyone else. Um, however, there's a set of organisational um, accountabilities and structures that I want to put in place here that the Bible isn't interested in telling me about, but I have freedom in. I've just chosen to implement my freedom at New Life in a particular way. And I wouldn't coerce a Bible passage to legitimate that. It doesn't mean I'm not interested in leaders having good character or in their convictions. In fact, we teach them about salvation by grace in we won here, and we, we make sure that people who are going to be leading our kids understand uh, justification and a whole bunch of stuff. We take them through the 39 articles of Christian religion. There's theology in there. I'm just not saying the core structure is validated by some theological presupposition. Does that make sense? Charles? Yeah, go, go, yeah. yeah um, what's your, uh, so you got people that go through that. Um, how, like, what's the conversion rate, so to speak, in terms of? coming on board as partners? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's two other things to sit behind this. So uh, the other thing that we do is we go and visit everyone in their home and we ask them to give their testimony. Okay? Two reasons for that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know personally that you converted. That'd be helpful. I want to hear that. Secondly, that's a weird one. Um, I, want to, I want to go to their homes because if they become a partner, it's likely that they can lead a life group. Um, and I just want to make sure it's not a weirdo dump that it's not dangerous for kids that might be around that. So I actually want to just go and walk through people's houses and just go, I would be comfortable with you as a partner, an ambassador of our church, having people in your home. Now, I've had no reason, I've had no reason to be 
concerned about that. It doesn't matter if there's washing on the floor. What, what I'm looking for, I guess, is, is this going to be a safe environment that I can reasonably invite people in? Do you have a seven foot high dog? Do you have, do you know, like whatever it is, like, like is, is this a place where I would feel uncertain about bringing my kids? Well, I actually just want to go and check that out. So we, we do that as a pastoral leadership team. So that's it. What, the question was, what's the conversion rate? Um, it's currently sitting at 100%. Because we tell people what it's about, we tell people there's no compulsion to do it, and we invite them to opt in when they're ready to serve. So how many people start the process who are uninterested in serving? <coughs> None. Um, why would you get to the end of it if you didn't want to serve? Well, you wouldn't. You'd opt out. So we, but we haven't had that happen. The best thing I can tell you is we had a lady who went through the partnership course who um, was just coming out the other side of a uh, uh, particularly difficult separation. And she said, look, I am just maxed personally at the moment. Um, I enjoy the course, but I'm not ready to become a partner. And four months later, she said, I'm ready now. So that's great. We've done all that, all that hard work. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we kind of just say, it's your choice to start the process. So when you're ready, come and join us. Serving in God's church where you have gifts and skills, but also where there is need. Okay? And we say there's actually a bunch of stuff that needs to happen at New Life Anglican Church, which are just we're going to start signing you up to. So the first things first of those things is uh, we're going to get you to be serving in, in, in our kids' ministry. So we have at the moment 45 adults, I think who are in our kids' ministry. Now I'm telling you guys, you probably don't have that. The reason is, we've said, it's really interesting, that this is DNA stuff for our church plan. We, we said, we could go and find some teenagers, potentially, who will look after our kids. But what we're saying collectively is, our kids don't matter, and we're going to outsource them while we do the big adult important stuff. We actually said, actually, do you know what? That's not, that's not, that's not the case. We don't believe that theologically our kids are unimportant, or that they're un unconnected to our church. The whole logic of it takes a village to raise a child, you've heard that. We, we, we said actually, who's, whose children are these? Yes. They're ours. So who should raise them up to know and love Jesus? We probably should. Here's, I'll let you in a little secret. A little secret. Um, we're a very weird church uh, uh, demographically. We, you already know we're weird, but we're a very weird demographically in the sense that we don't have any 20s or teens. So we didn't have a handy group to go, oh great, it's your job, well done. We don't have any, none. Our oldest now are about, I think we've got two or three that are 15. But we have got a massive, like the, the, the snake has swallowed, you know, a fridge. And it's moving through, the, like our demographics are moving through. We've got stacks and stacks of kids. So on a Sunday we have 80 kids. Right? Um, big. But we didn't have those people. So anyway, so I just said, look, how are we going to manage this? I don't want to outboard it. I want to make it ours. So I said, everyone's going to serve in kids. You might go, I am not gifted in this. And I'd say, come be a helper. We're going to pick the people who are the talented, gifted ones. We're going to help them to lead, do the lead. But come and sit in. You can actually do that. And here's the amazing byproduct of that. Our adults know our kids by name. And not just the ones in their family. And our kids know our adults by name. It is crazy. There is this beautiful cross-age thing happening in the life of our church because our kids see our adults week in, week out. And it's spectacular. And we'll be, yes, go. Would you have made that decision if you had only a few kids at your church? I'd love to uh, reflect on that. I, I don't know. Um, I think in the end, our, it's interesting to see uh, Greg was talking about the convictions of us. I think our conviction to say they're our kids was pretty high up on the order for me. Um, and I would love to have th thought that we'd do the same thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It, it's always it's a bit hypothetical, isn't it? But, but in the end, we made that decision. I'm so glad that we did. Um, it's still tough every week. So I, we have nine adults go out every week from our service to go and make our kids' ministry happen. Um, and they, they rotate around. But it's a big cost. It's a huge thing for our partners to be serving for the last four and a half years doing that every week. Um, but it's joy and it's been an incredible blessing to the life of our church, I think. Yeah, go. Uh, sorry, so as a part of this, like, going back to the money. Mm, yeah, we're going to get there. Sorry, yeah, yes, yes, we will. Uh, is, it, is it a part of 
part of this um, if you're affirming your existence to be giving? Yes, that's what I'm getting to. In fact, let's okay. go there. Um, so, uh, oh, that would have been handy, wouldn't it? Yeah. Someone should have blown it up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so anyway, so yes, so, so introducing us, but find out our, our vision and our commitments theologically, um, <coughs> how to partner with us, what, it, what our expectations are, how to do mission with us, and then how to do safe ministry in the life of our church. Okay, let's look up our Bibles. Some of the Bibles. Um, I want to show you how I talk about money at our church. Is that alright? Because this is what we're about, aren't we? So you go, come on, can we get some money here? Um, can I get you to look up uh, Leviticus 27, 30 to 33? Someone can read that when they find it. Leviticus 27, 32, 33. <coughs> We're all going to wait carefully, aren't we? Someone's got it already. Can you read it, Rosemary? Every tithe of the land, word of the seed of the land, of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he shall add a fifth to it. And every type of herds and flocks, every tenth animal of all that pass under the earth and star, shall be holy to the Lord. One shall not differentiate between good or bad, neither shall he make a substitute for it. And if he does substitute for it, then both it and the substitute shall be holy, and shall not be redeemed. I love God. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Let me give you a let me give you a little bit of advice. I know you're gonna cheat. If you cheat, what will happen? What, what was the problem if you cheat? So you try to substitute the animal, what happens? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Uh, God will take the substitute that you took and actually a good one as well. That's pretty cool. Um, now here's, here's what I want to say. First thing that we say, <coughs> in the Old Testament, God called his people to show up their honour to him by giving 10%. We say this is a guide, okay? I want to be incredibly clear on this. I don't think, personally, that there's a New Testament compulsion to tithe. I don't think you can make that case, okay? But what I do see in the Old Testament is that God called his people to honour him by giving a tenth of what they have. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, bin. And what I do is I actually play a game with, uh, with people and I've, I've got little bags of coins and I say, well, I've got, uh, I've got ten ten cent pieces here. Okay, I'm playing a game with my kids. Okay, and I say, I say to the kids, kids, daddy's playing the game now, how much can daddy have? And there's a variety of different answers. How would your kids answer? Does anyone know? Okay, yeah, so they might keep nine and give you one. Yep, or. No, no, you can keep nine. Oh, you can keep nine? You're, you're the dad. Yeah. So you're, the nine of them is yours and one, so you give to God. Okay, very good. So they might they might have the tithing mentality straight away. I reckon some this, I reckon kids would go either way. They'll go, uh, one. one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> mine, yeah. five, yours. Or some kids would just be really generous and go, Dad, I'm not really interested in this game, you can have all of them. <laughs> um, and the other, the other group of kids would say, Oh no. They're all mine, you can't have any, right? I, I think that's a variety of different responses that we see. So anyway, so in this in this here, what would a tithe be? And people say, there's 10 10 cent pieces. What would a tithe be worth what? 10 cents. Very good, you with me? Total down is a dollar, very good, we're all good. Um, if I make it if I make it dollar coins, so I've got ten dollar coins there, how many dollars do I have? Ten Okay, the tithe is a is it hard to give up the dollar? Anyone? I don't think it's hard to give up the dollar, right? Not dollar hard. I say, okay, well, let's turn this into $100 notes. How much money have I got on the table? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's a tithe? Okay, you're doing well. You guys are killing it. <laughs> uh, is it easy or hard to give it up? Okay, why is it harder? Seems like. Okay, right, all of a sudden, magically, it became, <gasps> it became $100. How much do you get to keep? Anyone? $900. $900. What are we obsessed about? It's incredible. This is this is sin in the garden. Side, side <laughs> show, just for a second. This is sin in the garden. God gave uh, Adam and Eve how much? In the garden, how many trees could they eat from? Everything. All the trees in the garden. What's Satan's lie? Satan's lie to say, take your eye off the everything that God gave you. Obsess on the one thing you can't have. That's sin, right there. What? What? And idolatry and all the rest and rebellion and pride. <laughs> okay, well, sorry. All right, but, but, but here's, here's the thing. So what Satan does, he gets to obsess on the bit we can't have and neglect the blessing of what we do have. Incredible, I think. So, so when it gets to $100, all of a sudden we start going, I resent this $100 very much. Even though at the $1 thing, it wasn't an issue. Imagine the $10,000 notes. There is no such thing. But imagine the $10,000 notes on the table. How much money is on the table? 
10,000. What's a tithe? 10,000. What are we all thinking? Whoa. Good gracious me. I, I could give God five and be pretty generous, couldn't I? <laughs> I mean, he'd be pretty happy with a thousand. I mean, that's a lot of money. Do you know what I'm giving up, God, if I give you a thousand dollars? It's just an incredible thing. Anyway, so what I say, this is my personal experience. I think this is incredibly helpful. It's a guide. There's no compulsion, but it's a guide. I have found when I give 10% and I started doing it when I got 20 cents pocket money, I used to have a $2 coin, I have a two cent coin, which is made of copper. Does anyone remember such things? Okay, very good. And I used to take that to Sunday school and drop it in. When I got my first paid job, I went to I went to the ATM. Because my job did, my um, church did take up a collection. I went to the ATM, I punched in the number for 10% of my weekly salary and watched it come out of the ATM. And I had a heart attack. <laughs> I said, oh, Serious? Is this the amount of money? What am I doing? And I put it in my pocket. I went to church and I dumped it in the bag. And then I had a holiday and I went away for two weeks. And I put two times that amount of money into the ATM. <laughs> what am I doing? But you just do it. And here's the thing. I, I think 10% is a magical number. First of all, you're not going to miss it. I promise you. 10% of whatever you get, you're not going to miss. I just reckon it's just it's invisible. But here's the thing that happens. When I give that away, it breaks the pride in my heart that will not open my hand. It just does. I think it's incredibly powerful. So the first thing to say is, I don't think we're under any compulsion, but I reckon there's a guide in the Old Testament. Can you see there's 10 things here? One of them circled, that's very good. We keep this, we give that, that's the guide in the Old Testament. Okay, can someone read this for me? In the New Testament, Paul exhorts the local church that it is their responsibility to support those who minister the gospel to them. So I'm going to say this is a given. Can we look up this passage here, 1 Corinthians 9, 7 to 14? That'd be really helpful. 1 Corinthians 9, 7 to 14. Someone read this for us. I know someone's got it. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because whoever ploughs and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual wheat among you... Hopefully that's seed. Keep going. See, is it too much if we <laughs> <laughs> it depends, it just depends on the content. If we have so spiritual seed among you, it is, is it too much if we reap the material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all and more? But we did not give but we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the other temple? And that those who serve the altar share in what is offered on the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Fantastic. Um, here's the big chart in the New Testament. It's the Lord's command. Did you hear that word there? The Lord's command that those who preach the gospel receive their living from the gospel. So I think it's a given in the New Testament that the local church support those who minister the gospel to them. Incidentally, I had no. I love my graphics. So I don't think. Um, open circles, one of the ten, and out of ten is kind of make a little cross. See that? Yeah. Um, so, guide in the Old Testament, given in the New Testament. Here's, I think, the most exciting part. Can you see our little open circle? Okay, someone read that for me. We are further challenged in the New Testament that the goal in monetary matters is to live out sacrificial Christian generosity. Yeah, don't mean it. How exciting is that? The goal, the goal is not to stop at 10%. The goal is not, you're obligated to 10%. It's whatever position you're at, growing with the grace of Christian generosity. Let's read the passage. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I want you to hear how rich they were in order to move towards generosity. Can someone read this for me? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. I want you to hear how well off they were before they could start doing this. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done to the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor. 
but they are also filled with abundant joy, which is overflowed in rich generation. For having testified, they gave not only what they could afford, but time more. And they did it of their free, own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift of the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we hoped. So their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. How well off were they guys? Out of their extreme poverty, it overflowed in rich generosity. How beautiful is that? And incidentally, what are we seeing? What's this giving going towards? Anyone able to remember what the situation is? Yeah, going to a different church. It's actually supporting church in Jerusalem, which is under persecution. And so we actually have here this incredible sense of the global church, which is, I just think, striking. Our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, we want to support. Out of our poverty, we want to give to see them supported. Uh, that's beautiful. What are they doing, though? They're practicing this beautiful goal of growing in, in Christian generosity. It's just magnificent. So what, what I try and say to the people at New Life, I think there's a guide in the Old Testament. I think there's a given in the New Testament. I think there's a goal for you. And I'll show you how we help people move towards that goal. Uh, we use a form. Now, again, I, I want to kind of speak to you about this. Uh, I'm deadly serious that people give real money to my church. This does not mean that I preach once and expect it to happen magically. I'm going to be really explicit here. I kept on thinking, when I see other people do this, I kept on thinking, how does actual serious money get unlocked in a household? Think about your house, okay? Imagine that in your household, you wanted to do something that cost $10,000. We'll take that arbitrary number, okay? To move $10,000 in your household, what has to happen? Discussion. Discussion. Who would have thought? With who? The other members of the household. Absolutely, why? Okay, because it's our money, we may not have that much, because it may take a serious realignment of what we do in order to do that. I keep on thinking, people who preach once and expect serious giving are nuts. What we, are, what we have to do is I have to facilitate a serious conversation in your home. And if I'm not, if I'm not thinking that through, I am crazy at thinking I'm going to unlock serious money from you. Okay? If you're adjusting the way you use your talents, if your money is being shaped, I'm telling you, that's an adventurous life, right? That is totally out of whack with our society around us. So, how do I help you do that? Well, first thing on this form I give you, as a part, as part of the partnership course, which is answering somebody's question here, um, I ask you, how's the kingdom of God shaping your time? So we say, do I come in a little bit on that? No, I don't, that's a shame. <laughs> um, I'll go back. Uh, uh, down, down, down. Um, so I say, how is the kingdom of God shaping your time? And I ask, what, what are you doing through the week? What stuff that you as a family are doing that's impacting your community? I think we're, we, we suck at recognising that actually a bunch of our people are making a, a great impact for Jesus in the community by being part of the community, and we never recognise it. Right? If you're not serving in my ministry, nothing of value is being produced, right? That's pretty poor. So we want to say, tell us about your time. How are you using your time? Feed it back to us how you're using your time. Secondly, we want to say, how is the kingdom of God shaping your talents? So uh, this is a longer side discussion, which I might major on now. But we say, here's your family members, and then under here it says, write what you're quite good at. <coughs> that's, that's pretty Australian, isn't it? If we said, what are you an absolute ninja at, right? <laughs> I, I've got nothing to say. We're not good at anything. You know? That's so Australian. So we, we talk about people, about thinking about yourself with sober um, judgment, which is from Romans 12. We tell people, actually, you're probably good at some stuff. If you can say you're quite good at something, we can probably use it at church. So why don't you tell us what you're quite good at? So time, talents, okay? And then we get to the bit that you're all very interested in, which is what we're going to look at, okay, down here. How's the kingdom of God shaping our treasure? I'm going to tell you how this works, and it has been very, very helpful for our people, okay? And all I tried to do is I tried to think about how do I make this conversation happen in a real home with real people? So, here's, the, here's what you do. You, you think about the guy given a goal. What I want you to do is I want you to write down what your income sources are. I got a little bit adventurous, 
because I put down the fourth income source because you know obviously I want to make sure I'm getting everything from everyone. Right. <laughs> um, so one, two, three, four. Then uh, here's the stuff. I, I, I can't. This no, it's just very simple, right? Okay. But here's what I want you to do. Why don't you add that up? That's a big number, isn't it? Great. Carry that number over to here. Write down what's ten percent of that. I want people to stare that number in the face and have a little heart attack. I <laughs> will throw up in their mouth, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. But, but why don't we have a look at that number, right? And, and then I say, well, what are you currently giving? <laughs> right? What, that number and then this number, okay? And then I want people to go and say, what's our generous goal? Where could we get to? And guys, I, I'm in the mortgage belt, right? Double income, kids may be going to a, a private school. People are... Everyone would tell me that none of the people I minister to has any money spare. Except, where do they go for holidays? Mm -hmm. How new is their car? All that stuff. But everyone has money for what they want to... So I'm saying, paint a compelling picture of the future and invite them to sacrificially contribute to it. And if it's a sucky vision of the future, do not be surprised if they keep going on holidays to Bali. I'm being too wrong with this too. All right, so then I say, all right, so that was your generous goal. Tell me what your commitment is. Okay, you may not be able to get there. So what we say to people is right now, today, you might be really constrained by your mortgage. You might have a bunch of car repayments. Your kids' schooling might be sinking you. And all I want to say is, I don't care. Um, let me just show you in practice what it looks like um, when we talk about the numbers. So in the partnership course, in order to make sure that people actually have some reason to trust us, we say, okay, so here's, um, so here's our budget. Um, for 2016, here's our budget of expenses for 2017. We were planning to grow a lot. Um, here's our staffing and diocesan costs. Here's our building and ministry costs, so you can see the difference between them, um, and they're all broken down down the bottom there. And then I say, here's our income. So here's what we're planning to earn in 2017 versus 2016. The big blue sausage is congregational giving. We were expecting that to grow massively. We're looking to add in uh, a grant here and have a couple of other little sources of income there. Now, what, what in practice we did uh, the other year was, uh, at the end of last year, we, we planned to raise $50,000 for this new position that I had. And God's been very, very generous to us and we managed to raise 50 grand from our congregation that was already giving to see the new position funded. Now, I can tell you how we did that, but what I want to encourage you is vision, need, okay, and a compelling picture of we've seen you be trustworthy with this. We want to join you in helping make this happen. Praise God. So, what that meant in practice was um, we saw our giving, well, so far it's on track. Where are we up to? No. Uh, <laughs> so far it's on track. Uh, grow from here to here. That's our, our, um, our income and our expenses, and they're basically on track, which is very exciting. So when, when people say, how can I help? We say, we want you to keep serving, we want you to become a partner, and we want you to be praying. Um, so what I want to say to you, money's a spiritual issue, and I want you to think, talk about it pastorally, that's the biblical picture. I want you to talk about it missionally, that's the gospel picture. I want you to talk about it unapologetically and yourself, that's the pastoral picture. Um, some resources, I'd like to send that form to you if you're interested. Rod's book is amazing, you should get it. There's this organisation called Geneva Push that has some information on the website, you should have that. Can you put that on Church in the Box? The, um, the uh, I'll see if I can't hear yeah, you. Absolutely. Um, so I've just been rabbiting on, and I've said a lot. Uh, I think we've got about 10 minutes for Q&A, and um, I've got all sorts of other things I can rant about. But um, come back a minute, ask me questions. Uh, I'll come here and I'll come back.